Okay, uh, this lecture is on Pierre Duhem, the Duhem problem and underdetermination, and how that's a problem for Popper's account of science of as uh, being one of falsification. So, first, Duhem uh, just sets up basically Popper's view, um, right? Which uh, you'll have a theory. And you will make a prediction from that theory. You'll derive from that theory in a sort of a logical deduction from the prediction. And you do experiment and see if that prediction is true. And if it's false, then the theory is false, right? Um, and it can all be done without induction, right? It's purely logical deduction, very sound, uh, rational basis for progress in science. And this is what UM says here. Uh, it says, from the proposition under indictment, or you know, the theory, the hypothesis. Uh, he will derive the prediction of an experimental fact. He will bring into existence the conditions under which this fact should be produced, so an experiment, basically. And if the predicted fact is not produced, the proposition which served as the basis of the prediction, the theory or the hypothesis, will be irredeemably condemned, that is, falsified. Right? Um, so remember Newton's uh, right, experiment, Right? There's an old theory that says a light is just one kind of ray. Right? Um, and this theory predicts that if you send the sun through a prism, um, you're going to get a round image on the other end. Um, so I put up the prism, prism right? I uh, run the sun through it, and I get an oblong image. I, do, I get a non-round image. Um, and so we can then say that, well, um, the prediction of the theory is false. Therefore, modus tollens, the theory is false. And if you watch the last lecture, this is all familiar. Um, so here's another example that Duhem uh, provides of falsification. Um, so if you look on the bottom right, right above my head, um, you'll see a polarized um, light ray, right? And now normally before it's polarized, you actually, this would be like a, a branch of a Christmas tree or something, bristles, waves shooting out in every direction. Um, so what you do is you send it through a filter. If you've ever done photography, you've seen sort of filters. There are these like sort of plastic films, and what they do is they block certain, some of the um, wavelengths, some of the waves, right, and they just send through one. So through this filter, just sends through one wave. Now, that picture there is what we now know is the truth, which is that you've got light of course is an electromagnetic wave right so you have um oscillations in so sort of the electrical current and then you have oscillations of the magnetic part and those are actually at right angles here now that wasn't known at the time of uh neumann right and neumann at the time thought that they were both uh oscillated in the same direction right so you would have had the electrical and the, and the magnetic going the same direction um, and the way they phrased that was that in a ray of polarized light, the vibration is parallel to the plane of polarization, right? Um, so we've got this diagram of what really happens, right? So um, you could, oh, and so, yeah, and what I say here is, I, again, I describe what I just said, right? Um, so Neumann thought the two would be lined up, right? And then, um, but, uh, we wanted to Wiener, right? The other scientists here, um, he wanted to challenge that view, see if he could end up actually falsifying that. Um, so, if Neumann was right, then you could predict a certain kind of interference pattern, right? If you bounced light off of something and had it interfere with its own, with itself, like bounce a light ray so that it hits itself, and you would get a certain kind of pattern. On, on the top there, you can just see a an example of an interference pattern where you have sort of two, when you have two waves, right, just as if you drop two rocks in a lake, um, you'll notice the waves kind of propagate and when they hit each other, you see certain fancy patterns, right? So if Neumann was right that um, the oscillation, the vibrations were both in the same direction, you would see a certain kind of pattern, right? So that's the prediction. Um, and so that's the picture in the top is, so, uh, Wiener set up a mirror, right? He, he did the um, experiment, did the reflection, uh, projected it onto photographic paper, and um, didn't see the pattern. Um, 
So this is a straight would be a straightforward falsification, right? Um, Wiener concluded that Neumann's theory is false, and in fact, um, right, the vibrate the vibrations are not parallel to the plane of polarization, and in fact, it's right. It actually looks like um, that little gif over there, uh, perpendicular. Okay, so and Popper's does this mean Popper's right? There's a pretty straightforward example of uh, falsification. Well, Duhem has a little more to say about it. This is not, Duhem says the story is not really this simple, right? So when Wiener did his experiment to falsify Neumann's theory, he didn't only use the particular claim that he wanted to refute, right? He assumed lots of other things were true as well, right? To do that experiment, um, I mean, here's just a short list of some of the assumptions, right? He, he assumed, along with Neumann, that light was in fact a wave, right? That has simple periodic vibrations. Um, he assumed, like Neumann, that um, the vibrations are going to be perpendicular to the direction of the light ray, right? Um, and that the mean kinetic energy of the vibratory motion is going to be a measure of the intensity of light, right? And you need this if you're going to use photographic paper, um, right, to capture the interference pattern or lack thereof, right? So he's also assuming that the photographic paper or photographic plate, right, um, the picture you see on there is an indication of the intensity of the light. So there's actually a lot going on besides just the single claim about sort of the direction of the vibrations, right? Um, so what does that mean? So call these um, all these extra sort of assumptions that you have to make in order to do the experiment auxiliary assumptions, right? Um, well, if any one of those things were false, then you would have gotten the same result, right? You would have gotten the failure of the predicted interference pattern. Um, if light wasn't actually a wave, then you wouldn't get the pattern. If um, photographic paper didn't do what you thought it did, you wouldn't get the pattern, right? Um, so you really need a, there's a lot of assumptions involved. In order. So really all your falsifying experiment can show is that at least one, maybe more than one, of those assumptions that you made in order to make the prediction and perform the experiment was false, right? So um, it's not just that if light vibrates perpendicular to the plane of polarization, we'll see these interference patterns. Um, really, uh, the sort of conditional, right, that he's trying to do modus tollens on when he falsifies it is if light vibrates perpendicular to the plane of polarization, and if the mean kinetic energy of the vibratory motion is a measure of intensity of light, and if the gelatin on the photographic plate captures the intensity, and so and so, then interference bands will appear, right? So the logical structure is a bit more complex than what Popper was talking about. So you don't have just if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P, right? really have is P and R and S and T and so on. If all of those are true, then you get the prediction, then you get Q, right? So when I do an experiment and show not Q, right, I show that the pattern doesn't occur, I can still do modus tollens, but the conclusion I get is the negation of that whole long conjunction, right? And um, in logic, there's a move you can use which is called Morgan's rule but a negated long conjunction like that uh, is equivalent to a bunch of or statements like what little b's are not p not r that's or so what you've really proven is um either not p or not r or not s or not t right so um maybe uh neumann's theory was wrong or Maybe photographic paper doesn't do what you thought it did, or maybe light isn't a wave, right? So this is the actual um, conclusion that you end up with, and it's not quite as helpful as Popper had supposed, right? You're not getting as much progress. You haven't falsified a very specific thing. You'd falsified this sort of large group of things, any one of which might be a bad egg. Um, 
And in fact, you know, um, another scientist, Boncare, I think he, I don't know how to pronounce this. Um, he showed that you actually could save Neumann's theory if you decided that maybe the false, right, um, the bad egg in that group of assumptions, uh, the claim that mean kinetic energy measures light intensity. And instead, if you claim that the measure of light intensity is the mean potential energy of the medium, right, deforming the vibratory motion at the time, that was we call sort of the ether right, that you want to move through. So if you um, change one assumption, right, and not necessarily the assumption that um, here was trying to disprove, um, right, you can save the other theory. So what happens is you can always someone falsifies your theory with an experiment, you could actually always try to save your theory, right, by instead rejecting one of the auxiliary assumptions. Um, so this is what Duham has pointed out as a problem for Popper, right? You can't deduce a particular experimental outcome uh, just using a single hypothesis. Um, rather, the theory it consists of a set of related hypotheses and to test what you're doing is testing predictions of that whole set, right? And also all these assumptions about the equipment you're using and, you know, your eyes work, when you're observing it, like a lot of stuff, right? All these auxiliary assumptions we call them. So again, a falsifying experiment doesn't show that any particular one proposition is false, um, but we don't just don't know it. Um, and of course, scientists are smart and uh, they do try to eliminate some of these issues. And again, we saw Newton with his experiment um, trying to rule out various things that could be the culprit, right? Using prism. So um, Newton's experiment, where he falsified the view that one kind of ray, right? He was aware that, like, oh, I, I am assuming that my prism is good, right? So these might be things that can be, oh, I can at least rule that out as. Um, Duham's point is just there's so many, I you can't really ever get a single hypothesis, especially when, you know, you've got a whole sort of pretty abstract theoretical assumptions going on, right? It's going to be difficult to decide which is the wrong part. Um, one more example. So a, a different uh, Newton story. So Newton, he wasn't right about everything, right? So he thought that light was made of particles. Um, and he thought that they were attracted to um, denser materials, right? So kind of like gravity, right? So they thought, well, okay, the earth attracts light particles from the earth. And that's why sunlight goes towards the earth. Um, so if that were true, the right, that would predict that light particles go faster through denser materials like water than they do through air, right? Because the water So uh, Fourier, he did a little experiment, proved that this was false, and in fact, um, light travels more slowly through water. Um, so was Newton's theory false? Um, again, uh, that's one possibility, but when we do this experiment, we're assuming a lot of other things too, right? So um, maybe, uh, maybe it's a refutation of the claim that uh, that uh, denser materials right attract the um, the light right, or it could be a refutation of the claim that matter attracts light at all right. Um, it could be a refutation of how the experiment was designed. So there's a whole Newton had this whole sort of apparatus set up with the theory, and only one part of it could be false. So uh, what do we do about this? Right? Could scientists just throw up their hands and say they don't know what an means i mean when we see in uh we do falsify experiments and we sort of take that progress um and doing things that you can sort of get a good way towards solving this under we call this the under determination right so any given experiment sort of under determines the conclusion you're supposed to draw from it um you could draw a number of conclusions from it you know just using good sense um, but a good way towards getting the right answer um, you know, some hypotheses are, are more likely to be the things that you'd want to pursue than others. Um, for example, like you're always assuming um, the laws of logic, right? 
usually using certain mathematical principles, it's unlikely that those are the things that went wrong. Right? Um, in your extra reading that I gave you, there's a paper by Quine. Um, he does claim that those are up for grabs too, but they tend to be sort of at the core of our assumptions that we're less likely to go wrong. Right? Um, but this Quine sort of, if you're interested in reading a very famous paper, um, yeah, he takes this underdetermination problem, which is sort of like ubiquitous, and um, and at any point you could choose to, you know, um, give up your hypothesis, or you could choose to give up on the laws of logic, or give up on the, the rules of mathematics. Um, it's all sort of like um, everything is flexible to some degree. But Again, right, we seem to be running into, just as with induction, we have scientific practice, right? And we have all the impressive things that science does, science does and, and we want to sort of respect that and say, okay, they must be latching on to something. And we're going to get more into this week four when we we'll talk about scientific realism. Um, but again, as philosophers, we, uh, we'd like to be clear on the logic of what's going on and kind of what we end up with is that um, we're dealing with just common sense, right? We're dealing with scientific fact, the way people do things, the way things they assume, the things they don't assume, and it's not always obvious what the rational basis for those assumptions are, right? Um, so that is it. It's a relatively short one for the Duhem problem. Um, and that will be it for week one, right? There's lots more to say about this stuff, and uh, there's some additional Readings, if you think this might be interesting for you to write a paper on. Um, next week, we're going to move on to scientific activity.